see what I'm sharing on the screen? Um, yes, um, we can see it. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, I have been doing some homework on Wikipedia and um, uh, uh, what I have found, Sir Paul, is that uh, uh, you were the founder of the Center of the uh, Studies of African Economies and uh, director of the Development Research Group on the World Bank. And uh, in 2010 and 2011, uh, you were named by Foreign Policy Magazine on its list of top global thinkers. It's a great honor to have you, Sir Paul. And you currently serve on the advisory board of the Academic Stand uh, Against Poverty. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I do a lot of things, but anyway, yeah, sure. Um, so you're a specialist, uh, specialist in the political, economic and uh, developmental predicaments of low income countries and your research covers the causes and consequences of civil war, the effects of aid and uh, the problems of democracy in low income and natural resources regions, countries, which is um, probably the, re the reason why you're advising Saudi Arabia. Uh, urbanization in low-income countries, private investment in African cultures, and changing organization, organizational cultures, which is exactly uh, the reason why maybe we in Morocco uh, 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 need your uh, precious insights. Uh, and uh, uh, I have uh, found this extremely interesting formulas, and I hope that you will be able to give us a uh, a few uh, uh, explanations about this uh, uh, start, very interesting uh, formula, nature minus technology plus regulation equals, equals starvation, nature plus technology minus regulations is plunder, nature plus technology plus good governance is prosperity. Uh, uh, Sir Paul, thank you for, for uh, accepting to share uh, uh, with us, uh, uh, some of your insights, and uh, I don't know if uh, Mr. President uh, Shakib bin Musa has joined us. If not, uh, I will uh, I will be happy to give you the floor. Uh, Est-ce que le président est avec nous? Toujours pas. Uh, uh, Sir Paul, uh, I have to say. Uh, that uh, uh, your conference will be broadcast uh, live on Facebook and that among the audience you will have, of course, members of the general public, but also journalists and academics. I will probably have to switch from time to time between languages, between English, French and Arabic, in order to translate the questions uh, that will be addressed to you by by the audience, uh, of course, by the honorable members of the commission, but uh, probably by the, the members of the audience. Thank you, Sir Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. So, um, um, just to ground things, I've got a new book called Greed is Dead, which is really, it just came out a couple of months ago. Um, and that is what I'll be, it's, it's those ideas, really. Um, because it's only been out a couple of months, you won't come across it yet. But, um, the, um, and let me start by saying um, um, there's a very important concept which is sort of being revived both in economics and more generally in social science, which is, um, which is called radical uncertainty. Um, the present COVID virus is an example of radical uncertainty where when it starts, the, the, the honest answer to the question, what should we do, is nobody knows. Um, and um, uh, uncertainty is at the moment um, enormously important um, both in um, the, the direct economic sphere of how do we revive an economy, um, but it's fundamental 
to the idea of the transition in a society. The transition um, in a society is a unique event. Um, and because it's a unique event, um, we can't estimate a probability of success. A probability depends upon being able to look at um, you know, 30 identical previous events, which then um, form a probability distribution. You, you just can't do that with the question of a transition in Morocco or the transition anywhere else. They're unique events. And so they're inherently subject to uncertainty. And that means to an extent, you're going to learn as you go. Um, but let me start, um, this is all about this, the title of the talk is Building Common Purpose. And let me start with a couple of um, European monarchies which have already built it. Um, uh, and they are um, pretty well the most successful societies uh, on earth by almost any measure you care to look at, whether it's per capita income, social cohesion, um, uh, human well-being, um, they're at the top of the world list. Um, and uh, one is uh, Norway, um, which is fortunate to have quite a lot of oil, but is still use that oil amazingly well. And the other is Denmark, which has no natural resources at all. Um, and usually, in most measures, Denmark is number one, Norway is number two. Um, my own country of Britain is, um, is, is much further down the list. Um, uh, if we look at the present experience with managing COVID, um, we find that once again, um, Denmark and Norway are the standouts, the outstanding successes um, amongst um, uh, both European and North American societies. Um, so Denmark and Norway have had very low incidence of COVID. It stayed low, it's staying low now. Uh, and they've also had some modest economic hits. Um, so they've not privileged mortality over the economy. They've succeeded on both. Um, so how have they done it? Um, they, they've succeeded with COVID because um, they were very rapidly able in, to introduce a completely new common purpose. And the common purpose was um, we must contain this virus. And the only way we're going to do it is by protecting each other. Uh, and so that new common purpose of let's get rid, let's contain this virus, whilst being able to get on with our lives, get on with the economy, that led to a very rapid formation of a common understanding of the, the nature of the problem, which was really, we need to know whether we've got the disease individually, and if we have the disease, we need to be very careful not to pass it on to others. And um, if we're elderly, like I am, um, we need to be very cautious so that we don't catch it from others. But we don't want to shut the whole society down because if we shut the schools down, it will do irreversible damage to our children. So that was the common understanding. And that developed a very straightforward common strategy. Um, if you need to know whether you've got coronavirus, we better do mass testing. And if you've got coronavirus, you better not pass it on to your neighbors. And so protect your neighbors. Um, and that, with a common purpose, a common understanding and a common strategy, enabled the fourth and really important thing that was in common, was a common sense of obligation. Everybody had to be morally load-bearing. Everybody had to recognize they had a responsibility to change their behavior. And um, that happened in Denmark and Norway, which is why they've got such a low incidence um, without having to shut schools, um, without having to close the economy. 
Um, the equivalent has happened, incidentally, in uh, New Zealand, um, where um, the Prime Minister always refers to New Zealand during COVID as we are a team of five million. That's the population. So team of five million means we've all got obligations to each other. Um, uh, so that's success. Um, um, you can contrast it with um, America, I'm afraid, where if you look at the reaction of ordinary people in America when COVID started, it was not exactly protect your neighbor, it was long queues outside gun shops. So the, the, the strategy that uh, developed in America was not as much protect your neighbor as shoot your neighbor, uh, which of course doesn't work very well. Um, why was Denmark and Norway able to do this very rapidly, develop a new common purpose? Because that's what they've been doing repeatedly for years. That's why they're top of all these global indices. They've just learned repeatedly that by building common purpose, common understanding, a common strategy and common obligations, the society works much better. And so they just keep doing it. Periodically, new common purposes come up. And then the, the whole uh, machine goes into action and they come up with a common strategy and common obligations. And then quite rapidly they succeed. Because they succeed repeatedly, they know that this is a good approach. And so the, um, the success maps back into reinforcing the underlying ideas. So that's what success looks like, building common purpose. Um, um, America clearly doesn't have it, have it at the moment. Um, Morocco has it to a limited extent, um, but it's not at the moment really a society in which people have a lot of trust in each other, um, nor, unfortunately, a lot of trust in government. And so the, the process of transformation is primarily about resetting ideas. Um, the, the, there's an economic component to transition, which is basic economic infrastructure, like energy and connectivity, um, but that's not the core. The core of a transition is resetting ideas. Um, and it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, how do you, so the next question is, how do you do it given where you are now? And given where you are now, it's no good just, as it were, copying Denmark and Norway. First of all, you're different. But secondly, Denmark and Norway have already built the whole apparatus. And what you need is to learn how things are built, not what they look like when they're built. And so you need to see examples of it being built. Um, it's a trans that's the transition, something that is being built. Um, I often use the concept um, scaffolding. And uh, scaffolding is what you need in order to build a tall building. Once you've built the tall building, you take the scaffolding down. Um, and then you can admire the tall building, you know, the Empire tall building, the Empire State Building in, in New York, very, very tall. We can stand it, stand by it, and then be amazed by it. Um, but looking at it, doesn't give us any clue as to how it was built, because the scaffolding's not there anymore. And so what you need to understand uh, is the scaffolding. And that's what I'm going to try and give you in the next few minutes. Um, so how do you build um, that scaffold, that, that, that common purpose? You start by two processes. Um, one is uh, building trust in government, and the other is by conducting dialogue 
within the population. Um, maybe I'll start with dialogue because that's what you're doing as a group. And um, dialogue is a special sort of communication. It's a communication which is a bit like playing table tennis or ping pong. It goes backwards and forwards. And the very fact that you go and stand at a table tennis table tells, tell, tells people you, you've agreed on a certain set of rules. Um, you've agreed um, to uh, respect those rules and to respect your neighbour. You, you don't win at table tennis by going round the other side of the table and hitting your opponent on the head. Um, and so you're participating in the process. And a dialogue is like that. The, the process is to try and reach a common understanding. And so what goes backwards and forwards is um, a, a quest on each side, a quest to understand the other, to try and build some common understanding. So that's the quest. Um, and that's what you've been doing as a group of 35 of you. Um, searching for some common understanding. Um, and that's a, a microcosm of a process that needs to become continuous in the whole society. Because participation in a dialogue gives people agency. Um, they're contributing to building some common purpose initially, then they can build, participate in building a common understanding of what the problem is, why, why the purpose hasn't yet been achieved, and then they can participate in a common strategy, and then finally, because they've participated in all that, um, they recognize that they all have obligations, and they have to meet those obligations. And that is the so dialogue, of course, it gives everybody agency, um, is an inclusive process that ends up with people being willing to bear mutual obligations. The essence of bearing mutual obligations is that you're prepared to sacrifice your own self interest. You move away from me, now, my rights. Um, to uh, from me, you move to we, and from now, you move to some future goal. And from my rights, you move to our obligations. That's the transition you need. Um, at the moment, you're in a discourse where people are screaming for their rights, their entitlements, me now. And that is a very unhealthy place to be. So that's what you're trying to move away from, me now. And dialogue is the best way of doing it. Um, let me move on to um, the other technique for trust building. Um, and this is something that comes um, primarily uh, from actions that leaders can do. And of course, you've been appointed by the king and uh, the king is a very, kings generally, a very important position in society um, uh, because they're, as with Denmark and Norway, they're seen as, um, as having legitimacy and, and they're listened to um, uh, because they're in some sense above political disputes. Um, so what can leaders do, um, both the king and, and political leaders? Um, they can build trust in what they say um, by a technique which is called signaling. And the economists in the audience will know about signaling because um, my friend Michael Spence got a Nobel Prize for, for it. Um, and signaling works like this. Suppose that um, uh, you don't know whether to trust me or not. 
um, I could be trustworthy or I could be um, after something. I could be after a consultancy contract, let's say. Okay? And you don't know. Um, um, and you're suspicious of what I say because maybe um, it's, 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 I'm working towards something that will be in my own self-interest. How, how can I, as the speaker, um, uh, clearly establish um, that uh, I'm not trying to advise you for something that's in my own self-interest? And the answer is, I need to do some action um, which is costly to me and which if I were basically after my own self-interest, I just wouldn't be prepared to do. And so that's a, 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 an idea of a, a, a sac an action which sacrifices my own self-interest for the common good. Um, so if you were suspicious, I try to end up to the consultancy contract. I could just say, incidentally, I won't accept the consultancy contract. No? Um, and that would be a, a costly signal um, that, that, uh, that could, um, could, could allay your fears um, of one type of uh, sort of malevolent purpose. Um, so um, that turns out to be a form of leadership which human societies have developed. Um, and I'll draw to a close with this, but it's, it's, it's quite uh, fascinating in its way that around, uh, humans are a form of mammal and all mammal species other than humans have only one type of leadership and it's called leadership by dominance. And it's basically the alpha male lion who's the king of the pride. And if you think about it, you can look around the world and see, well, humans are mammals too, and some of our leaders are, uh, are just like that, they're dominant leaders. But uniquely, humans have developed a different style of leadership, which is also evolutionarily stable. And that style of leadership is a leadership which is much more modest um, and uh, self-sacrificing and become and wins the respect of the group through um, sacrificing in the interest of the group. Now, those sort of leaders um, become trusted um, and so they're listened to. So there are two roles for a leader commander-in-chief, taking all the decisions, and communicator-in-chief, resetting people's ideas. And the sort of leaders that are needed in a transition are not the commanders-in-chief pulling levers. Because remember, with a transition, nobody really knows how to do it. You have to learn as you go. And the form of leader that's most valuable is one that's trusted, listened to, and so becomes the communicator in chief. Um, final thing I'll say is how do you learn as you go in these transitions? Um, you need to push a lot of decisions down in a decentralized fashion so that you get experiments in parallel. People, teams, companies, cities, towns, try things because they have the power, devolved power to do them. And some of these things work better than others. And the things that work will get copied. That is the real dynamism that has to be harnessed in a transition, a decentralized process of everybody having the power to take some decision and uh, building this common purpose in the process, but discovering how best to do things. And then those discoveries, those ideas spreading across the society as they get copied. So that's, um, uh, in a nutshell, 
how to do a transition. Um, and that's, I think, the process that you as a, as a, as a group, as a commission, can actually help to ignite uh, in Morocco. So let me pass back to the floor to you. Thank you, Sir Paul, for this uh, valuable insight. I would like uh, um, uh, our president has joined us now, and uh, maybe uh, we could uh, give him an opportunity to react to what you have just said, and maybe uh, uh, let him ask the first question if he wishes so. Otherwise, we will move on to the honorable members of the commission who would wish to ask you a question and to uh, the members of uh, uh, the public who are following us on, on Facebook. Thank you, Sir Paul. Shakib? I don't know if uh, uh, the president is able to connect to us. So let's move probably to. Uh, oh, oh, he's I, with us. I had a, my mic was not on, in fact. So, so thank you, thank you, Professor, for uh, uh, being with us uh, today and uh, with the, uh, so on behalf of all the members of the commission. I would, uh, I would like uh, re uh, to express my. Uh, my thanks and for your time and for uh, this uh, dialogue with the members of the commission. Uh, of course, we are very uh, interested in on how to manage the, the change and how to manage the transformation. And uh, it's uh, maybe it's the, 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 the our the heart of our of our work during all these months we have been uh, we have been working on the model, so we are quite uh, interested in uh, in your uh, uh, the, uh, on, on the points you 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 you, uh, you shared with with us uh, on building the common purpose, on building trust, and how we can improve such trust to 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 have. Uh, to 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 create the condition of a real uh, transition. Uh, I may, maybe my, my question could uh, could be on uh, what are uh, uh, your point of view on the the, the the mechanism because once you have the, this common purpose, then you have to deliver and then you have also to have some kind of uh, uh, follow up which means that uh, it's not uh, one time uh, uh, i mean job it, it, it's a continuous job which has to be uh, adjusted uh, on, on on a long time period so uh, giving your experience could you tell us of how different uh, uh, countries are uh, deal uh, with such uh, problems Yes, certainly. Um, I think there are two big points. Um, one is that right from the start, um, everybody has to be educated into the fact that there will be failures as well as successes. Um, and so people need to be prepared to be forgiving of failures. It's very, this, this is so important, of course, um, the temptation is to overpromise, to, to come up with exaggerated promises which get people's attention, get people excited, but then you can't deliver on those exaggerated promises. Um, and then, um, people, uh, you actually lose trust, you destroy trust. So the basic proposition is you under promise relative to what you are confident that you can deliver. Um, and you prepare people for the fact that 
because this transition is full of uncertainty, um, there will be failures as well as successes. But the failures are perfectly acceptable. Um, people shouldn't feel ashamed by failure. It means they've tried something. And so uh, you need to encourage an attitude which um, welcomes experiment and accepts the price of experiment will be that some things don't work. So that's the starting point, is that whole shift of attitude. Avoid the massive temptation to overpromise. Over all around the world, politicians have lost trust. Leaders have lost trust. If you just look at all the indices, the reason they've lost trust is they promise things that then they've been unable to deliver because they don't know how to do it. The second point is you do need to start with things that are likely to succeed. And as you as you start with the bits of success, um, uh, first of all, the people doing things start to build a bit of confidence, self-confidence, so they'll do more things. But secondly, more people join in. Um, there's a famous little psychological experiment which, which goes like this. Is, if I ask you, how did your football team do last week? Um, and if it won, you will say, we won. Nothing surprising there. But if it lost, a lot of people will say, oh, they lost. We won. You move towards success. They lost. You move away from failure. And so if you start from a situation where people are pretty distrusting, they don't think um, these things are going to work, start with something that's easy. Start with something that's easy to do so that you can get a bit of success. And let me give you a, an extreme example of that, um, uh, which is the the man who was brought in as Prime Minister of Tunisia in, um, in 2014. Um, and um, he came to, to testify before a commission that I ran. And he, he, he'd become Prime Minister because the, the, the previous government had resigned um, and just handed over to him. He was a technocrat. And he knew he got no legitimacy and very little capacity in the Tunisia of 2014. And um, foreigners came in and gave him long lists of advice, the IMF, the World Bank, and so the UN and so on and so forth, long lists of all the things he should do. Um, and he knew he couldn't do any of them feasibly uh, because he'd no legitimacy and people were very suspicious of him. So what he did was he went on the television and he said, um, uh, what are we going to do? Our first priority is to clean the mosques. The mosques have been neglected. Um, uh, they're in a disgraceful condition. We're going to clean the mosques. Feasible? Yes. Easy. Pretty easy. Very visible. Everybody on Friday saw what was happening. Um, did that build trust? That he did he announce something that they cared about and he'd done it. Yes, it did. And that gradually built him some space to do things that were a bit harder. Right? So failures to be expected. Start with things that are easy that you know you can do and work up from there. Do not start with some big, complex, grand projet because the grand projet invariably crash. Right? Um, they take vastly longer, cost vastly more than planned. Um, and so people become very disillusioned. Start with things that are small, people care about, people will notice, and you can do. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sir Paul. Um, if you don't mind, we're going now to uh, let uh, members of the Commission ask a few questions. First one is uh, Khalid Mishat. Khalid, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear Karim. Uh, Sir Paul, thank you uh, very much for uh, your great, great um, 
uh, intervention. Uh, it was uh, extremely enlightening. Um, I have uh, three questions. Um, the first is, uh, uh, you talked about how uh, the head of state um, uh, can can drive leadership through the second type of leadership, as you uh, as you explained it. And then we go into uh, what we commonly called in companies middle management. Um, the issue is um, we've had uh, quite a few trials of transformation in various um, uh, elements of uh, of our society, whether it be education, health, and so on. Um, and it always had issues as to working either uh, into, you know, getting to its full potential, answering to the KPIs that it, it made, uh, or just actually working. And um, we we always ask ourselves why it didn't work. And so I want to know uh, from your own standpoint, from your own point of view, how do we create a paradigm shift that will transform the middle management, the people that work in the ministries, the people that handle the projects, um, to be able to follow the common purpose and to be able to work um, through the uh, paradigm of uh, the sacrificial sacrificial leadership. Um, the second question is around communication on uh, failures. Um, I understand that we need to communicate about our successes um, uh, and these types of different and small, as you uh, mentioned, transformations that we would uh, undergo and work on the projects, but how do we communicate on failures as to give, uh, again, coming back to your point, um, give the understanding to all people involved. If it's a city that made a failure, to give an understanding to other city managers, mayors, and so on, that it's okay to fail. How do we communicate that failure in a, in a way that would uh, uh, give that impression without disappointing the big population. And my third and last question is, um, how do we construct uh, a dialogue, leadership, and common purpose that's not only inclusive um, in its target, which means that um, when we set up a common purpose, we say that this common purpose is going to uh, help people uh, with disabilities or help uh, include women, but actually in its construction or its building blocks, how do we envision a common purpose that's built also by those uh, uh, communities that are seen as uh, disadvantageous or that are seen as marginalized, not just to see them as the target of the, the charity or the result of the projects, but also building blocks of it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Sir Paul, if you don't mind, we are first going to take the questions of the other uh, uh, honorable member of the commission before uh, uh, giving you the floor to uh, to answer all of them. Sure. Thank you. Uh, uh, Simstafa. Et donc il y a Simstafa qui sera donc suivi par Nargis et par Youssef Saidani uh, uh, qui est avec nous mais qui n'arrive pas à accéder au chat. Simstafa. Uh, merci Sikarim. Uh, thank you, Sir Paul, for very enlightening. Uh, uh, presentation. Uh, my question is a bit related to the previous one. Uh, it's on that uh, the nature of that common purpose that you alluded to, uh, and and to which extent that common purpose should not be a purely mechanical or or technical one, i.e., an economic strategy strategy or a vision, uh, but should be a common purpose that touches on mindsets and representations. In other words, uh, has to transcend, transcend the, the, uh, the, the purely technical aspect of a, or even economic aspect of, of things. Uh, and the second part is, if that's the case, the, the question is how? Um, you know, how, how do you, in the long run, touch uh, on representations. You know, you mentioned the importance of having a uh, leadership communication based on uh, uh, on initial trust, etc. But, you know, in, in companies, uh, corporations, we know how to do that. 
at individual levels. You know, it's called coaching, but it's really <laughs> psychoanalysis, so to speak. Mm -hmm. but how can it be done at a societal level? Uh, yeah. You know, I know it's a long run proposition, but uh, are there mechanics to yeah. do it at a societal level? Thank you. Merci, Simstafa. Nargis, à toi. Uh, thank you very much, Karim. Uh, thank you very much, Sir Paul, for your uh, very insightful presentation. Um, actually, just to build on the previous questions, um, you mentioned that uh, the Nordic countries, you know, they have similarities in their political structure, uh, i.e. being also kingdoms and this giving more legitimacy. Um, and that's uh, um, for their response, you know, for their COVID response, they were more successful because they had this common purpose. Um, but um, before the crisis, the trust was already there. So it was kind of already established um, in the mindset and this from a very young age, you know, in uh, basically uh, the school uh, curriculums. And uh, um, yeah, so it was kind of already established. How can we do in a country where we need to start from the basics, you know, from scratch and kind of rebuild, uh, rebuild, um, build this trust. Do you think that in um, this specific timing, because of COVID, that adds an extra factor that may impact tremendously the process, and this factor is uncertainty, how and can we do that, you know, is it following the same steps? Or do you think that the approach should be slightly different because of this uh, extra level of uh, uncertainty? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your question, for your answer. Merci, Nargis. Youssef Saadani, est-ce que, est que tu peux intervenir? Oui. Est-ce que tu nous entends? Très bien. Oui, je suis là. Je ne sais pas si vous m'entendez. Parfait, you, on t'entend bien, Youssef. On t'entend bien. OK. okay. Uh, thank you, Sir, uh, Sir Paul. Uh, so I have uh, two quick questions. Um, the first one is about the experience of uh, uh, of European countries that you mentioned. Um, uh, um, I, I, I think that um, until the 19th century, uh, they were divided and uh, very violent societies. So what happened uh, so that they uh, they started uh, building this trust, uh, transitioning from uh, fragmented societies to cohesive societies? What was the, the turning point? I mean. What did they do uh, so yeah. to, to, to be successful in this uh, transition? Um, so that was my, my, my first question. Um, the, the second question is about um, how you can build uh, trust over the long run, uh, because uh, my understanding is that uh, family is where trust is inherited. So basically, as a child, you are mostly exposed to your parents. Um, if you see your parents cheating, if you see your parents breaking the law, uh, there might be some tr transmission between the generations uh, within the family. Um, so uh, how do you break this cycle of distrust um, from generation to generation uh, over the long term? Should school uh, uh, teach trust? Um, against, I, I would say, against social and family values, mm -hmm. uh, because if, if if distrust is entrenched in, in society, um, basically school should be kind of shield against social uh, values to diffuse other type of uh, uh, of, uh, of values. Have you have you already thought about uh, I mean uh, this uh, school uh, dimension of uh, trust building? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, I think, Sir Paul, that's all the questions we have for the moment. So, if you if you will, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, the first question was um, uh, about, directly was about firms and, and if a chief executive wants to make change, what about middle management um, as the sort of obstacle to that? And um, and that's right. Um, 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 I think it's in Greed is Dead, um, or in my previous book, The Future of Capitalism. I tell the story of how Toyota 
defeated General Motors um, in the struggle for the American car market. General Motors in the 1960s, the most profitable firm that had ever existed on earth, and by 2009 was bankrupt. And the reason General Motors was defeated by Toyota um, was because Toyota managed to build a new relationship between the chief executive and the ordinary workforce. And General Motors couldn't do that. Um, and what Toyota managed to build was common purpose. The common purpose in Toyota was let's build a fault-free car. Um, and for that, they needed the willing compliance of the workforce. They hung cords all the way down the assembly line. And the, mo the, the motto they introduced was, if you see a fault, pull the cord because faults are treasures. Because if we can correct the faults at the source on the line, we'll produce fault-free cars. Um, and uh, th that was a hugely costly strategy because if you pull the cord, um, the whole production line stopped at once. It cost $10,000 a minute. Um, but um, as long as uh, workers used that power responsibly, you ended up with very rapidly with fault-free cars, um, which is what Toyota did. Um, General Motors could never do that because they got a very oppositional workforce. And when the chief executive finally ordered these cords to be hung along down the line, the line managers knew that workers were so oppositional they would pull the cords all the time. And so the line managers, the middle managers, tied those cords back up again. Perfect symbol of the chief executive. The management doesn't trust the workers. Um, so how do you get out of that? How do you do a sort of Toyota type thing? Um, there are two techniques, um, uh, both of which have been shown to work. So one is once the chief executive has made clear clear signaling actions, a bit of self-sacrifice, and clear explanations of what it's all about. Um, so once that's been communicated to everybody, then set up um, for sort of structured processes in which peers, ordinary workers, can come together as equals to discuss how they are going to implement this strategy. Um, and so the structured and regular um, dialogues peer to peer, not manager to worker, worker to worker, or middle manager to middle manager. How are we going to do this? Because once the chief executives announced the purpose, um, you find that in these strategies, um, uh, people seldom challenge the purpose and rather they start discussing with each other how they can do things as a group. And that seems to speed up quite dramatically um, the process of, um, of getting a new purpose diffused widely in a company. So structured peer-to-peer -peer dialogue around how to implement the new purpose. That's recent research in Switzerland that's shown that. The other technique um, is for the chief executive to create a vanguard. Um, by vanguard, I mean an identified group of people who have the responsibility of changing their behavior first. And so being in the vanguard is prestigious, but it comes with this expectation that you're going to walk the talk. If you're a member of this prestigious new vanguard, you better behave, visibly behave differently. And then you gradually expand the vanguard. Um, to give you an example, in a, an African country I've worked with, um, first the uh, tax authority was reformed um, by a team of people. And once that spread widely in the tax authority, then Senior people from the tax authority were appointed to other uh, components, to other parts of government, where they brought in the same techniques and spread the same techniques. So peer-to-peer -peer discussion and vanguarding. 
Um, the second question by this, the same gentleman was, um, how do you build acceptance of failure? And um, there, are, there are two things. One is um, be honest with citizens. Be honest that you don't know fully how to do these changes. You know that once they're done, they make a big difference. Look at Denmark and Norway. Um, but transforming Morocco has never been done. Nobody knows how to do it. And so you will try things. They won't all work. But it's heroic. You, what you're going to celebrate is not just success. It's experiment. Um, uh, China, for 40 years, has been doing this. Um, there's a, a government research center and the the head of it is a vice minister, and he explained to me very thoroughly how they do it. So they agree on some common purpose, some, some goal that they want to achieve over the next four or five years, a goal. And they accept that they've no idea how to do it. So they then send people out to all the decentralized regions, the cities, the towns, the regions, and they say, you have the power in that environment to initiate some new strategy. But, um, uh, but, but that's what you must do. If you haven't tried anything in the first six months, we'll recall you because you failed. Your duty is to experiment. Not, your duty is not to succeed, it's to experiment. Um, if you do an experiment which happens to succeed, that's great. And we'll send other people to you to have a look at it because they might learn from you. Um, if you try an experiment and fail, that's OK. You've tried something and we'll learn from the failures as well as the successes. So that's a culture of being acceptance of failure. Celebrate the, the new approach, um, not uh, whether it succeeds or not. Um, Europe really failed to do that with Sweden during Covid. Sweden tried a different approach, and what the European Commission should have said was, bravo, that's wonderful. We don't know whether it will work, nor do you. But if it works, we'll all benefit a lot from learning, and if it's a disaster, um, you've been very heroic, because we'll all learn not to do it. Instead, the European Commission tried to introduce uniformity of response to COVID, which was a really foolish thing to do, given that nobody knew how to cope with it. What you needed was a lot of experiment. Um, um, the final question there was, how do you make um, change inclusive, common purpose inclusive, especially in marginalized communities? And the answer is, it has to be done with and by those communities, not done to them. And so my own country of Britain, is, the, is shockingly highly centralized. All public decisions happen in London. Um, we're the most centralized society in the OECD. And it's quite disastrous. Um, so it's proved in COVID. Um, Whitehall in London cannot um, devise a good strategy for Manchester. It has to be done by Manchester with Manchester. Um, so do things with, not do things to. Um, uh, let me turn to the second question, which we can speed up on, I think. But this was um, uh, how to get um, how to how to how to get um, common purpose within an organisation like a firm. And um, the and he, the, the the speaker said, well. Um, you're emphasizing not the not the economics, but the, but, the, but the ideas. And I just want to stress that these ideas have a very straightforward, valuable economic implication. When you've got common purpose and common obligations, um, you can think of that as having willing compliance um, in a workforce, willing compliance among citizens, and willing compliance very sharply lowers the cost 
of getting things done. Because if you don't have willing compliance, all you've got to rely on is monitoring and incentives and coercion and penalties, and that's very costly and doesn't work very well. So willing, building willing compliance really is a very powerful economic asset when you've got it. Um, and then you pose the question, how do you change mindsets? And as you said, the, you know how to do it individually within a company, it's called coaching. But how do you do it at scale? And doing it at scale takes us back to this idea that I sketched earlier of peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer dialogue on how you can actually, how they, middle managers talking to each other or workers on the production line at uh, uh, Toyota, Toyota created the concept of quality circles. So people weren't in a circle on the production line, they were all in a line, but conceptually, they were to, told, you six people are a circle. You're jointly dependent on, you're jointly responsible for the quality on this stretch of the line. Uh, and that peer-to-peer -peer pressure meant that each morning they could all discuss, well, we better spot, you know, here's a new, um, new piece of, a new task that's being performed in this stretch of the line, we better spot the errors. And so they held each other to account. Um, the, uh, the third question was, uh, was similar. It was about how did, um, and the third and fourth questions both, how um, do you change? And the, first, the third question said, given COVID, have things, has it made things different? Has it made things easier, harder? And always with transitions, um, remember, nobody knows. Nobody knows how to do a transition when you start. Um, if you don't know, you need to find out. And there are two ways of finding out, both, both, and use both of them. One is experiment, decentralized experiment, try things, learn from them. And the other is look at others who've made a transition relatively recently from starting from a position that's not so different from your own. Okay? So try and look for some societies that you think, well, 10, 20 years ago, they were more or less where we are now, and now they're in a better position than us. How did they do it? Um, uh, so um, that's, that's not as easy for Morocco as it is for some, some countries can learn a lot from what Morocco's already achieved. But I'm sure Morocco can learn from looking at transitions that have recently uh, moved things forward in some other societies. Um, the, um, the final question, this was twofold. One was, um, how did Denmark and Norway do it? Because as the questioner said, they weren't always like that. Um, Denmark in the 19th century was a horrible, violent, divided, unequal society. Awful. And Norway, at the beginning of the 20th century, was a colony. It, it, was, it was the one European country that was a colony itself. Um, so they're both amazing turnarounds. Um, uh, the stepping stones by which they turned around um, were, were different in each of these societies. Um, they were relatively recent, um, uh, and they, they were different one from the other. In Norway, um, uh, quite a lot of the change came actually through a, um, a powerful trades union movement, which is now much weaker, um, but that created the impetus for solidarity. Um, Denmark um, started in the late 19th century with a, with a reforming king. Um, so, um, and the, the king sort of took on the uh, established uh, uh, aristocracy and said, no, we've got to change. Um, and so there was a struggle between the king and the established uh, aristocrats. Um, 
so these are different stories, and your story will be different again. Um, um, that's why it's a unique event, um, which you'll, you'll learn as you go. Start with things that are pretty easy to do so that you get some success. And then there was a final question about um, intergenerational transmission of bad ideas, and uh, bad cultures. Um, and um, I don't know Morocco well enough to know whether that's a problem for you or not. Um, it seems to me that historically there's much of value in Moroccan culture that's being transmitted, um, as well as much that you need to change. Um, uh, I'm, uh, this afternoon I'll be talking with, um, with, uh, with Sicily, um, local government in Sicily. And uh, Sicily is um, famous for um, uh, having had a transmission of a very high degree of distrust um, father to son. Um, there's a famous vignette where a father stands a six-year-old son on the wall, holds out his hands and says, jump. And the boy jumps. And then instead of catching him, the father stands aside and lets him fall and hurt himself. And then the father delivers the punchline to the six-year-old, never trust anybody. So that's the transmission of distrust in a culture. And that indeed is pretty damaging, right? If you start from something as bad as that, um, uh, how do you change things with difficulty? Right? Um, uh, but it clearly needs to be changed. It clearly can be changed. Um, uh, so um, I, I think it would be, shall we say, unwise to go head on against um, family cultures. Um, families have many valuable aspects to their culture. I think the real enemy, perhaps in Morocco, certainly in my own society, is not family culture. It's a, a sort of teenage culture of me now, um, my entitlements, my rights, and I, when do I want it? Immediately. And so the me now society is not a culture that's um, uh, linked to family values at all. Family values are much closer to a we and are much closer to thinking that links the past of the family, the future of the family. And so I would be more inclined to build on the concept of the family and say Morocco is actually a big family rather than try and unstitch um, families altogether, as it were, family values altogether. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Paul. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to, uh, 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 give you the questions that we have received from the from the public. But before that, if you don't mind, uh, I have one more question from uh, a member of the commission. Si Mohamed Fikret, est-ce que tu m'entends? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Karim. Thank you a lot, uh, Professor Collier, for your presentation. Uh, when we observe some countries uh, outside, uh, I am interested by three cases, which is uh, China, uh, Rwanda, and also uh, Catalonia, Barcelona. For the three uh, cases, they succeed in their uh, development. They have a good uh, uh, growth uh, last uh, years. And uh, I would like to know what's your opinion on their uh, way of working on their approach. Thank you. China, Catalonia, and the third was? Uh, Rwanda, Rwanda, the African country, Rwanda. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank you. So, um, of the three, the best, the, the one I know best is, is Rwanda, um, though I have indeed just written something for the main Catalan newspaper, and I've already described to you what I think China's strategy has been. Um, and China's strategy has clearly been very successful. Um, 
I think China's strategy is actually at the moment um, really under some stress because um, President Xi seems to be um, very keen on centralizing power. Um, and that is is really going against the uh, the previous decentralized experiment approach. Um, uh, let me talk about Rwanda, where it's an amazing transition. Um, after all, if we go back um, uh, 25 years, uh, this was a society in complete ruin. Um, uh, there'd been mass slaughter um, and the society was um, was the ultimate fragile state. And now it's a role model um, uh, for the rest of Africa. All around Africa, people are looking at Rwanda. And uh, how did they do it? It was very consciously a resetting of um, of ideas around common purpose. And so it started with trying to build some sense of shared identity. And so um, nobody in Rwanda is allowed to talk about uh, the previous tribal identities. Um, I think perhaps as part of that whole psychological change, uh, they moved from a French speaking society to being a bilingual society. So it's now bilingual French and English, which is actually enormously valuable um, uh, in economic terms. Um, um, but it was part of a psychological reset of what does it mean to be a Rwandan? Um, uh, and we know from um, survey work that that has actually, and the, the government used communication through what it did, um, which was very broad based development, trying to be inclusive um, uh, spatially and ethnically in terms of bringing benefit economic growth to everybody. Um, uh, and it was, uh, so those were the signaling actions. And then there was um, a, a very careful and continuous um, uh, um, campaign of, um, of, of uh, narratives, new narratives, the new Rwanda and the new Rwanda. And we know from survey work that that has gradually helped to reset the way people think about who they are. Um, it's also made people to be proud to be Rwanda. Um, uh, they also tackled head on corruption. So they used the technique of vanguarding. They created a vanguard, most notably the police force. And the police force uh, is well paid, always gets the best equipment. And the police are really very fully signed up to this new purpose. They are going to um, uh, keep uh, Rwanda um, honest. And so, um, uh, when when you when you I can walk the streets of uh, Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, I can walk the streets at midnight and feel completely safe, um, which I couldn't do. I couldn't do in London. Um, um, uh, and you, if you tried to bribe a Rwandan policeman, you'd be in jail, as you should be. Um, so, um, and my goodness, the police enforce the rules, um, sometimes to an infuriating degree, but they really internalize the mission. I am here to enforce these rules. Yeah. So uh, that's happened in just 25 years. Um, Rwanda has been growing fast, so it's had big economic benefits. Um, uh, Kigali is a clean and uncongested city, things work, um, but this, the basis of it has been this, this resetting of the mind. Um, they also follow this technique of um, encouraging experiments. So they agree on common purposes, and then they structure, 
They say, right, this is what we want to achieve this year. You're going to be responsible for trying to achieve that. And so there's a whole chain of responsibility all the way down the, society, this is the, this is the public sector. I know because every, every year, the president convenes the top 200 public officials in an army camp for three days. He lives like everybody else, he eats the same food. Um, they're not great living conditions, I know, I've been there. Um, uh, but um, in turn, all those 200 people have to stand up over the course of three days and say how they've tried to achieve that purpose that they were tasked with. And sometimes they've achieved it, sometimes not. If they've achieved it, great. If they haven't achieved it, they have to explain why and what they have learned from it. And if they can do that, that's okay. If they can't come up with a plausible explanation of why they failed and what they've learned from it, then they lose their jobs. Okay? So that's the Rwandan story. Uh, I don't want to presume to talk about the Catalan story, but um, it's a little bit like the Scottish story of trying to build um, a shared identity by saying whatever we are, you know, the Scots build shared Scottish identity up by saying um, there's the big bad enemy, um, England. Um, and the Catalans have, to an extent, tried the same thing. There's the big bad enemy, um, Madrid and Spain. Um, I don't think that's a very healthy approach. Uh, it splits the, the country up. We need to try and build common purpose across the society. Um, uh, so I think that's, that's the answer to that one. Thank you, Sir Paul. Uh, Thank, you. Now, Thank you, Professor. Uh, now, if you don't mind, we're going to move to the questions from the audience. And uh, so the, the first one is from Mr. Mehdi. Education has been a work in progress for the last 49 years with little success. Obviously, it's very difficult. When, I, of course, I mean trying to reform education in Morocco. Uh, uh, obviously, it's very difficult. Based on your suggestions, do you advise that education is left unreformed until the government gains credibility through smaller and easier reforms? So that was the first question. Of course, I'm, I'm at your disposition if you want me to repeat it. No, no, I've got it. Uh, uh, second question is how to reconcile between encouraging experimentation, which starts at a small scale and takes time to show results and be scaled up if successful, and the urgency of big systemic reforms. The government usually has five years to implement policies and want to move fast which leaves very little room for experimentation. That was the second question. Yeah. The third question, how can we expect compliance from millions of people who strongly feel they have been marginalized for decades? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me take those. Um, education reform. Um, the um, uh, look. If you don't, if you've tried something for 49 years and it's not been very successful, then um, um, two, then, then clearly at the moment you don't know how to do it very well. That seems to be the implication, um, and so you need to find out. And remember, there are two ways of finding out, experiment and learn from others. Um, um, the most successful um, uh, education performance in Europe is Finland. Um, uh, the most successful in Asia is Singapore. Um, so, um, what I would suggest is that you look at Finland. Um, Finland's fairly easy to, um, to, to learn about. 
Um, there's a nice little book just come out by a guy called Riding, B-R-E-I-D-I-N-G, uh, called Too Small to Fail, which is a series of case studies uh, in small countries that have done very well. And that includes a study of the Danish education system. Um, but there are two books, this is, sorry, the Finnish education system. There are two books by Finns in English um, um, called Finnish Lessons and Finnish Lessons 2.0, both of which are just about um, how Finland uh, has done so well with education. Um, uh, so it's relatively easy to learn what Finland did. Um, it's also relatively easy to learn what Singapore's doing. Um, see whether any of those ideas could be used for experiments in um, in, in Morocco. Um, don't don't say we found the future and it works. We're going to do uh, Finland in Morocco. It might not work in Morocco. But you could decentralize it up so that you, some, some places are encouraged to try it. Right? Um, so um, uh, don't overpromise. Start from the admission we've tried. That, 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 that first statement, we've tried for 49 years and it doesn't seem to have worked very well, was a very honest statement. Um, it'd be great if somebody in authority you know, if a minister of education said that, we tried for 49 years and we're still not really very satisfied. Um, I wish a British minister of education would say that um, because it's the truth. Um, and then say, we're going to, we're going to try some different things, um, um, but we've got to learn from others. And so some of the things we try will have worked, are things which have worked elsewhere. And then the second question, was this trade-off between experiments, which is a slow process, and, um, and the big um, systemic reforms which um, respond to urgent needs. And here, my, my own advice will be quite, quite unambiguous. Um, do not do big systemic reforms all at once. Um, uh, you will overpromise on them and they will start to go wrong and people will become even more despairing. Um, uh, that has happened so many times around the world. Um, uh, it's happening my, in my own society this year. Um, our Prime Minister promised us we were going to have a world-beating um, uh, test and trace system. Um, well, we haven't got one. We haven't got one that's even um, one that works very well at all uh, compared with other societies. So um, uh, it's a tragedy because as with many governments, our own government started off with a high degree of trust um, at the start of COVID. Um, People wanted to believe the government would bring people together and knew what it was doing. And then it overpromised. If, it only, if only it had said, like, we don't know how to deal with this. We've got to try things. Um, we've got to err on the side of caution, but we want to try things. Then, then, they, then, then they could have, that would have been the, the honest position. Um, experiment doesn't happen, to, doesn't have to be slow. Um, as long as you do experiments in parallel, you can learn pretty fast. China has been doing that basically in a sort of four-year cycle um, for 40 years, and that has produced the biggest transformation out of poverty uh, that the world has ever seen. So once you get this engine of the whole psychology of experiment going, it runs very fast. And delivers a lot and it delivers reliably. Experiment delivers reliably. The grand projet fail reliably. Right? Um, 
And then the final question was, was a, good, yeah, a very good one, very pointed one. How can you expect marginalized societies to comply um, when they've just been excluded? And you can't. So the first message to marginalized societies can't be, um, here's a load of obligations. Right? Um, that will clearly um, just add fuel to the flames. Um, um, but equally, um, what, what you really need to do with the marginalized societies is engage them and include them in these, in, in these dialogues. Um, uh, it's not a matter of just giving them benefits. Um, it's really including them that's the that's the right that all marginalized people um, should be granted the right to be heard the right to forge these purposes um, which can be done at many different levels including at the level of a marginalized community a dialogue within a marginalized community on what does it want to do that can help itself not just what does it want to demand, what it can do if, if by people working in common within the marginalized societies to improve their own situation. So moving away from an oppositional identity of hatred of authority to say there are some things we need to do with authority and there are some things we can do for ourselves. So agency, the agency of dialogue, and then the agency of common action. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Paul. Uh, so it was really an extremely enlightening uh, conference, and I can't stress how grateful uh, we are uh, for your time. So in the name of uh, the, the, the commission, of the president's commission and all the honorable members who were with us, and also in the name of uh, the members of the general public, I would like to thank you again. And uh, we'll hope that we'll have uh, an opportunity to meet you here in Morocco and uh, have you assess how we will be uh, uh, moving on with our attempt at uh, building common purpose and achieving uh, a transition. Thank you, Sir Paul. Thank you very much. I first came to Morocco over 50 years ago, and uh, please don't leave it another 50 years. I will. <laughs> <laughs> so see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Professor. Thank you, Sikarim. Thank you. 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 Thank you